Good morning. We're so glad you're here with us on this brisk fall morning. <laughs> We're going to warm ourselves up. If you'd stand with us, we're going to sing. Welcome to those of you joining us from home as well. Let's praise him. He is a good, good God. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It is a privilege to be here with you this morning. I know we are small in number here, but we can raise our voices together and the angels in heaven will join us as we worship the God who was and is and forever will be. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet, we shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord, our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross. Then he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Redeemed by His grace, let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We 
shout out your praise. Amen. His grace is good, isn't it? And his mercies are new every morning. No matter what the day held before, we have new ways, new potential, limitless, boundless ways to see him working, to see the creation that he has made for us, the sunshine today, and the look on your brothers' and sisters' faces around you. Take a moment to look around you. He has blessed us to be the body of Christ. son Jesus you came to a world that was a mess walked among us loved and taught us offered grace and showed us the way to be reconciled to you you gave us everything we need you are enough for everything we face you are more than enough because we can't imagine how big you are, how great your love is. We can only marvel at the wonder and the mystery that you would go so far. So God, I pray that we would open our hearts and our minds to you this today and 
ask for and expect that you will move within us because you are right there waiting for us to ask. You are good. You are king. You are mighty. And we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I ride, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my you are good, good, oh, you are good, good, oh, you are good, good, oh, you are good, good. the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails the anchor in the waves oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins the echo of my days oh he is my song you are good morning. Thanks for worshiping with us today. I am Jim Jensen, one of the elders here at Footville, and um, we want to take this time in our worship service as we do each Lord's Day to take part in the Lord's Supper. And if you're a believer, you're welcome to take part with us. If you did not pick up 
a little cup like this as you came in. Would you just raise your hand and uh, someone will bring one to you? It's, um, it's November, Thanksgiving month, so I wanted to talk this month a little bit about um, Thanksgiving, gratitude, giving. Um, last week, if you were here or tuned in, you, uh, uh, we talked about some of the ways we have to give, kind of the how and what we have to give to, some of the funds that um, we have available here to give to. Um, today I want to talk a little more about the why. Um, I was in one of the stores the other day and it's obvious that um, the stores are all about Christmas already, um, gift giving. And so I had a thought about a gift, a gift that um, I had given my dad, I don't know, I think, I think about 60 years ago. Um, for some reason, he kept it. And he, uh, I remember he kept it on his shelf at the bank in his office. Um, it was there for a while. I can't imagine how many times that would have gotten knocked off or whatever, um, got in the way. It looks like he's repaired it a couple times. It looks like it's been glued. It's, it's, what it is is a couple little sailboats that go around on this piece of wire, and the sails are like paper thin. So I don't know, can't imagine why it didn't get completely destroyed, but it didn't. So it was a gift, um, and I was I don't know, eight years old. It was the coolest thing ever to me. But I'm sure to him it was like, what in the world am I going to do with that? Um, but he kept it. And he repaired it. Um, and he even paid for it. Um, I didn't have any money of my own at eight years old or whatever I was. Um, but because of my love for my dad, I wanted to give him a gift. And so that was, that was what I picked out. Um, that gift to my dad reminds me a little of my giving to God. I don't give to God because he needs my money. I don't even give because the church needs my money. I give because I need to give. I give because of what he has given me. Everything that I have is a gift from God and my, gift, my giving is a response to God's incredible love for me. I like how the Apostle Paul puts it in uh, Romans 8. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? And he has. John 1.16 says that we have received grace upon grace, blessing after blessing. John, uh, 1 John 4.19, um, he writes, we love because he first loved us. There's, there's nothing we can do to earn that love. There's no way that any of us can repay Jesus for what he did for us on the cross. Thankfully, he doesn't expect us to. But he does ask that we remember what he did for us. And in remembering that, um, when we do, we're reminded of the love 
that caused him to give his very life so that you and I, who were dead in our sin, might live forever with him. Jesus has provided our greatest motivation for the way that we live our lives. Because of his great love for us, we respond with a life of service and generous giving that pleases him. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for for all that you have blessed us with. We remember now with thankfulness the sacrificial love of Jesus as we take part in the Lord's Supper. And as we give back to you as an expression of our worship and our gratitude, we pray that you would um, take our gifts and use them to accomplish what we as your church have been called to do. And may our lives and our giving be a fitting reflection of our love for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning. If you do have your prayer list, I have a couple of additions. You might have seen the text that I sent out this morning uh, from Amy Ping, her son Evan Clark. Uh, He has seizures, and he's been on seizure medication for quite a while. Evan's, I think, 18 or 19 years old. Um, But he's having a lot of complications with his meds right now. He's having a lot of brain fog. He's nauseous every morning when he wakes up. Um, He is very depressed about that uh, as well. Um, He had been, um, he had been starting to drive, which he has to be seizure free for a certain amount of time before he can drive. And while he was driving, he had a seizure. And so that kind of put him back uh, a lot of months. I think at six months, he has to be seizure free. So for a 19 year old kid feeling that way all the time, not able to go anywhere that he wants, relying on his parents all the time, that can be really hard. And so if you'd pray for Evan, 
not only for um, things to be worked out with him physically, but also for his spirit. Um, he's a great kid. I've had him at paintball camp lots of times. And so if you'd pray for Evan and also pray for uh, Amy and Troy as they try to figure out how to help him and, uh, and encourage him. Uh, also, uh, and I'll send this out a little later, but um, if you'd please pray for Amelia. Amelia is um, Bonnie and Larry Clark's granddaughter. Um, and if you know their son, Todd, this is his daughter. Uh, she was in a one-car accident. She hit a tree, and so she is in intensive care. She's on a ventilator. She has multiple broken bones, internal ble bleeding. She's in very critical condition. She's 25 years old, and she has a young child, a young son. And so if you would be praying for uh, Amelia and for the doctors, and pray for Bonnie and Larry. I know this is hard for them, too, and for their son Todd and their family. And so just be praying for those, uh, both those people. Uh, let's take some time and pray. I'm going to give you a couple moments of quiet. And maybe there's something you want to pray or talk to God about that uh, isn't on our list. So I'm going to give you about 30 seconds, then I'll pray, and then we'll look at our text this morning. God, we thank you for this day that we can be here together, and we thank you for uh, hearing our prayers. God, we thank you that you are always with us. You see us uh, when we uh, go through things. You are there with your Holy Spirit is present to help us. And so, Lord, I pray that you would be with Evan. Uh, just encourage his heart. Help him to just feel your presence. Uh, help Troy and Amy to know what to do uh, to help him. Lord, this... Uh, uh, all the stuff that he goes through related to his seizures is just really difficult for him. And so uh, just give him strength. Lord, we also want to pray for Amelia. Uh, you know what's going on. Um, you know uh, that this was going to happen. This didn't take you by surprise. And so you know uh, how to care for her. And Lord, I pray that you would just give the doctors wisdom and understanding. Um, help Amelia's body to heal. Uh, give her strength. And be with Larry and Bonnie and the rest of the family and encourage them as well. Lord, as we look at our text today, I just pray that you would uh, speak truth to us through it, that your spirit would reveal uh, things out of it to us, and that your spirit would speak through me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad it's over. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I don't even have to say it. Do All the political ads are gone. We, we watched, uh, we, had, we record things, we record stuff like The Voice, and we went back and watched last Monday's, and it was like, oh, there's ads in this still. So, of course, being recorded, we could just skip over all that. But isn't it a relief for them all to be gone? I don't know about you. I got them, uh, of course, on the TV. I heard them on the radio, uh, got them in the mail, uh, got the phone calls, um, I even, uh, over the last couple of years, I've, I get texts. Do you guys get texts? And in fact, for a while, they thought I was a person named Dennis, and they kept texting me and asking Dennis to vote and do this and kept using Dennis as my first name. All, I mean, this went on for two years until I told him this past summer that Dennis was dead and why do you keep sending texts to his phone? And finally it stopped. And I'm so glad about that. But... Aren't you glad it's over? It's, uh, it's crazy. Um, and I, I know that now that everything's done, there are probably people that you voted for that won, people that you voted for that lost. And um, so maybe you might be thinking we need a lot of better candidates. I wouldn't disagree with that. Uh, maybe you feel like we need just a better sense of humor as we go through all this. And, and I... I, Jill, we work as election inspectors over here in Footville, and we saw more people come uh, for this midterm election than we did for the presidential election 
in 2016 to just kind of give you an idea how many more people are starting to come out to vote. Um, but we often get things written in. The great writing candidates, people like to be funny or humorous. Um, we've had Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. We've had those. We've had no, none of them, don't want them. Uh, or why would I vote for any of these people? We've had that. Um, we have had people vote for their neighbors here in town for various races, you know, for like president in the primaries or Senate. We've seen all of that stuff. And uh, this past Tuesday, we didn't see anything unusual. Uh, we do, uh, there has to be registered write-ins for us to even worry about what got written in, and we didn't have any of those, so we didn't have to really look through and see what people wrote down. Um, but I also am interested in how things are playing out throughout the country, and I went just kind of looking around at a couple of places, like I go to the Rock County Clerk of uh, County Clerk to kind of look at election results, and I like to see how different places voted um, and different issues that they voted for. And I, you know, peruse um, news sites and look at vote totals. And I, one of the races that just got decided, I think, yesterday was Nevada Senate. Any of you pay attention to that? Any of you notice anything unusual in the candidate list? There were six, six, uh, six things that were voted for. The first two were the main two people running for it. Then there were three independents that were actually four, five, and six. Number three was none of these. And I thought to myself, you know, seeing all these goofy answers that I see, I'm like, that's hilarious that none of these is getting votes. And then I looked at the total. It was 10,000. This morning, it was, it was 12,500 when they almost finished counting. And in the go I, I was like, well, that's kind of weird. Let me go look at the governor's race. Same deal. Number three in the governor's race or four now, I think, was none of these. Uh, today, that had over 14,000 votes. And I was like, either this is a really good joke that a lot of people went together on, or something's going on. So I went to, I just Googled it, and it came right up. And so I went to go look. Apparently, in the state of Nevada, in statewide races, they give the option to people, whether it's president, vice president, governor, senator, they give the option for people to vote none of these. That is always in those races. They can always vote for none of these. <clears throat> and the margin of, of victory in that Senate race was less than 1,000 votes, I think. It wasn't a lot. So almost 12 times the number of people that could have decided that race decided they didn't want any of them. I don't know if you went and looked maybe at um, Rock County's uh, results, but I went looking around, and as I'm scrolling down through, you know, you kind of see results as they happen as far as importance in their mind um, when they organize those. But um, the House of Representatives race, that I don't know if any of you voted in this race, uh, depending on where you live, um, I think it's District 1. Uh, there's... Uh, three candidates on the list, uh, Ann Rowe, and then Brian Stile, and then Charles E. Barman. Charles E. Barman uh, had a great party name, just makes me want to just vote for him. His party name was the Going Away Party. That was his candidate. He, he came in as a protest candidate saying, I don't like any of these options, I'm going to just do this, and that's my party, and Jill and I were going someplace yesterday, uh, or Friday, I think, and I drove by, and there was one of his big, you know, big sheet of plywood signs painted, Charles E. Barman, you know, his website. He, uh, he's a farmer over in Lake Geneva area, and he's just kind of fed up, and he, he decided that he was going to deliver his uh, signatures to get on the ballot in a very unique way. He bought, brought them to the county clerk in an empty Modelo beer box and handed them in that way. But there are things like that that uh, I think sometimes uh, are good for us to see because I think we need a little levity after what goes on in all these election campaigns. And I'm sure they're going to start back up soon. I don't know about you. I'm already getting emails 
about supporting things going on in Georgia, and quite honestly, I'm tired of it. I keep unsubscribing from them. They keep showing up. Um, but we need some levity from things like that. We need to have a break from those things. And there's a lot of things that, that go on around elections that aren't good. I mean, I don't know about you, but there's sometimes you see people go after each other on social media, or you'll get people going out just stealing yard signs and doing whatever. And a lot of people just think they can act however they want because they feel like this is the most important thing that's gonna happen this year and treat other people badly. And then as soon as it's all over, think, well, I can just kind of go back to acting how I was with them before and they'll all be okay with that. There's a lot of conflict, I think, that gets embedded in relationships because of silly things like elections and getting so worked up over them. Well, in this text, I think Paul is going to give us a pattern for how we can live in a nation that seems to be constantly attacking people who hold differing views and opinions. And we live in a nation that has fewer followers of Jesus than ever before. I think I was reading one, um, it was uh, not an exit poll, but it was just kind of understanding the electorate and those who voted. And of those who voted and responded to this poll, 19% of them on a, any given week go to church. 19%. We are very much a post-Christian nation. Uh, Christianity is a minority in this country, no matter what people say. But we have a nation that also attacks Christians uh, when they stand on biblical truth. And none of this is new. Uh, biblical truth has always been attacked, and that's because the battle is deeper than the issues in our nation. So Paul starts by telling us uh, a little bit about what the true conflict is in our world. Uh, we have lots of issues that people disagree on and fight about. Uh, there are many opinions on why there are so many problems in our nation and in the world there are lots of areas that we would say this is a source of conflict or this is the issue or this is the thing we disagree on. There really is one, only one root cause for all of them. Look at verses 16 and 17. It says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. In my Bible, flesh is not capitalized, but spirit is. Maybe that's true in yours as well. So spirit in all these words, is the, or all these places in this chapter, is the word pneuma. That's a referring to uh, the name of God the Holy Spirit. So that's who's showing up. So when you see spirit in these texts, that's who it's talking about, the Holy Spirit. Flesh is the human earthly nature of a man that exists apart from the divine influence of God and therefore is, pro is prone to sin and is opposed to God. The earth is focused, or the earth focused human nature in all of us is in conflict with the Holy Spirit. And it is this human earthly nature which is the root cause of every issue, problem, and conflict that leads people to sin, both individual sin and sin that is corporate, that, or sin that involves and affects other people. And so I'm not saying that what happens leading up to elections uh, encompasses everything that comes from a fleshly human nature that is opposed to God and prone to sin. What I am saying is that there's so much other stuff that goes on around that event in our nation where sin shows up in it or sin is injected into it because people have that fleshly human nature and they lash out or they are angry or they are hateful or they are mean or whatever it is. We were told that one of the trainings, some of the other sites, I think here in Rock County had to do, was active shooter training. I would have never thought about that when I started doing this in 2016. And so they were like, well, what do we do? And I'm like, well, I'm out here. I'll just tackle them and you guys lock the door and hold out. 
And really, that's the only option we had at that point. But it's crazy to think about those things. There's a lot of stuff that goes on. The fleshly human nature, that's the root of all issues. It's also what's trying to destroy us. Paul, when he writes letters to churches or individuals, he often uses lists because that helps him formulate his ideas, helps give concrete, practical things for people to understand what he is trying to teach. The main thing he wants us to learn is that the flesh and the spirit are in conflict, but he also gives us two lists in the text to kind of illustrate how they are in conflict with each other. And so he wants to be clear about what he's talking about. And and often we look at these as they describe as what we should or should not do. But these lists, they are not exhaustive. They don't include everything. But they do help us see this first one, what the flesh looks like. And the second one will show us what the Spirit wants us to become. So look at verses 19 through 21 as Paul describes the flesh. He says, The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, uh, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I'm not saying that I saw all these things in the political ads, debates, discussions on social media about the election coming up, but I certainly saw a few of them. I'm sure you did too. So some of this stuff was going on there, and those things will destroy people, they will destroy organizations, they will destroy families, nations, they destroy trust, they destroy unity, they destroy cooperation, care for others, encouragement, truth, morality, and so much more. And the reason why I say this list isn't exhaustive is because there's a couple things you might think might make the list but aren't there. Murder's not on the list. Neither stealing. And you think, well, if Paul's going to make a list about the acts of the flesh, wouldn't those things make it? I want to suggest to you that it's probably pretty good that they're not there. They're on other lists. We can find them other places. Jesus speaks about those things Directly, I believe. But I think some people get in their minds when they see things like those two in a list like this, they go, well, I might have a problem with alcohol, but I'm not a murderer. Or I might be a little unkind to each other, have a little issue with anger, but I'm not stealing people's stuff. Some of these things on here, people would look at and go, well, that's just, that's not a big deal. That's not something we need to worry about. Let's worry about the big things. And what Paul's trying to get us to see is that in God's eyes to this holy, perfect God, everything is a big thing. And if we engage in any part of it, it's going to destroy us. It's going to take us down. And it says, Paul says right at the end of it, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is where God reigns. And so, if we look at the book of Revelation, the earth won't be here when Jesus appears, when he returns. There's a new heaven and a new earth. The former things have all passed away, and God's throne will be in the new Jerusalem. And Revelation 21, 27 says this, Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So let me be clear, any one of these acts of the flesh unchecked, unforgiven by God, not covered by his blood, are enough to keep anyone from being with him for all eternity in heaven. They're that serious. What we need to be focused on, what we need to be allowing to happen We need to ask forgiveness for sins like this. We need to let Jesus' death on the cross cover those sins. But it's more than that. It's what the next list talks about, and that's what God desires. So let me tie together clearly for you why I'm talking about elections 
in this text. How we act from this point uh, after matters. It does. How we treat other people from this point forward matters. You might have a neighbor or a coworker or even a family member that totally disagrees with you politically, that has been your face about stuff, that says mean things to you or other people. Uh, I've seen some pretty nasty things get said. Maybe you've just got someone out there who's just a pain in your side. Someone who's always unkind to you. No matter what the situation, no matter what they have done, Paul gives us a list for us for how we can live and show them who God is. So let me suggest that Paul's going to give us a post-election life plan. Uh, People create life plans for a lot of different reasons, to make decisions, have direction, achieve goals, develop skills. And so the second list, it's what God desires. And if we embrace what's here and live it, it will transform us. It will transform our relationships and it will transform the way we treat other people when they are living out their fleshly nature and intend to do us harm and make it very hard for us to live by these things. Here's those, those verses, verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. I'm going to talk about each one of these very briefly, just a few sentences. But before I do, let me say this. We are to let the Spirit so fill us that we bear fruit. And I think when we hear that phrase, bear fruit, oftentimes as believers, at least I did growing up when I was told to bear fruit, I'm going to Matthew 28. Oh, I got to make disciples. I got to see people saved. I got to tell them about Jesus so they can get baptized, they can save, they can come to church, they can, they can do it. That's how I grew up thinking. I think that's an easy way to think about bearing fruit because I think that's tangible. When we see someone make that decision to follow Jesus, we can say, that's awesome. That's progress in their life. Might I suggest to you that if you want to see that, you have to bear fruit this way. That if people don't see this kind of fruit in our lives, we won't see people come to Jesus. Not as many as there should be. Not because of how we live. They need to see Jesus in us because quite often I get that excuse from people from time to time or I see it other places when people are talking about why they don't want to go to church or be around Christians. It's because... They've been around Christians who don't bear these kind of fruits here in verses 22 and 23. So when we live these fruits, people will know that we're not just saying, hey, go to church because you need to kill an hour on Sunday or go to church for some status. They will know that we're absolutely serious about following Jesus because we're willing to do these things no matter how anybody treats us, including them. Because I've had some people that I've tried to invite and they've not treated me so well. Should I lash out? Well, that's not going to do any good. No, I need to do these things here every time. And that's hard. It is. But I think it's the best way for us to help disciple people and teach them about Jesus and how to follow him is that they see we're following him no matter what. So love, the first one. Complete, unconditional love. Same word as in John 15, 13, where Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, than one lay down his life for his friends. So we need to love others deeply and completely, even when they behave badly or they hurt us. It's not easy, but it will bear fruit. Joy, not happiness. That's not the word here. The word is joy. Choosing to be glad when you have no reason to be glad. That's joy. Same word as when we look at the writer of the book of Hebrews. He wrote this in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. That for the joy set before him, that's Jesus, he endured the cross. Joy is a choice. 
When Jesus saw the cross, it, he wasn't thinking about, man, this is really going to hurt. It was the joy that he felt knowing that people would come to salvation, that they would be with them for all eternity. That's joy. Happiness doesn't have to be there for you to have joy. They need to see that in you. It's a choice. Peace. It simply doesn't mean you're not fighting with other people. It's not what it means. Uh, it also means that having peace that comes from Jesus. Peace knowing that you have salvation through Christ and therefore you have nothing to fear in this life no matter what happens. Jesus said this in John 16, 33. These things have I spoken to you so, so that in me you have, may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. Having peace doesn't mean a lack of problems or a lack of conflict. It just means Jesus is with you, walks as you go through them with you, and helps you make it through them. The next is forbearance, or patience is another word we use for that. It can mean long-suffering, steadfastness, perseverance, constancy, slowness in avenging wrongs. And God has showed patience with us. He wants the world to be saved. He wants people to be saved. And so there will always be people who try our patience. I often hear people say, I prayed for patience and then I met that person or I dealt with this, or I had this happen, and why? But Paul writes in Romans 2.4 that God's kindness, forbearance, and patience is intended to lead us to repentance. It's intended to lead others to repentance as well. And so I'm sure you have people in your life that it's hard to be patient with. Uh, and there's probably a lot of people who aren't patient with them. We need to express that fruit, bear that fruit, so that they will know God's patience for them through us. Kindness. Uh, this word only shows up eight times in the New Testament. Uh, one of those other places is in Romans eleven, twenty-two, where Paul writes about the kindness and the sternness of God. And so from that verse, it's clear, God's gonna punish sin. He's going to do that. And those who sin, but he also extends kindness to those who believe in his grace extended through Jesus. Without his kindness, everything that's left is sternness. It's punishment. And so people need to see kindness in us. Even if they deserve punishment, even if they deserve consequences, they need to see kindness. Goodness. God gives good things. It's why he's patient with people who, deserve his, who don't deserve his patience. It's why he is kind to those who deserve punishment. The, good, the goodness of God is what is undeserved. The goodness of God demonstrates his love and extends to everyone. We need to be good to people, good like God is, even when they don't deserve it. We need to have his goodness. Faithfulness. Faithfulness shows up in many different ways. And the word has several definitions, but one caught my attention. It's the character of one who can be relied on. People don't simply need to know that we have faith in Jesus, that we believe what Jesus has done for us, that he has died on the cross, that we trust him for our, our salvation. They don't need to simply see that. They need to see us being faithful. And not just to friendships or job commitments. There's lots of people who do that. Well, lots of people that do those kind of things. They need to see us being faithful to God. They need us to, to see us being faithful to what he teaches. They need to see us being faithful and speaking the truth in love to others. We need to be people of conviction when it comes to how we follow Jesus. And that is what faithfulness is. Gentleness. 1 Peter 3.15 tells us, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak malicious, maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. 
Ravi Zacharias put it this way, and I love this definition. He would often debate people when it came to um, what was true about God. He would um, debate people about um, what he believed about God and why people could believe God. And he always said this, my goal was never to win the question. My goal was always to win the questioner. That's a great perspective. Because we can be right about what's in here and never win the, the one who's questioning it. They need to know that we believe it, yes. We need to stand solid on the truth. But we need to do all of that with gentleness so that hopefully in the end they will go, well, maybe this stuff really is something, there's something to it. And we win them to Jesus. People have questions. Many doubt God exists. They need us to answer respectfully and gent gently. Self-control. People push each but other's buttons all the time. People try to get reactions all the time. Uh, people get tempted to, to say things to people all the time. We have to have self-control. We have to make choices over and over again uh, to not engage in the list that was previous to this. We have to stay faithful. We cannot give in to sin. We have to remain Christ-like. Could you imagine how often Jesus just wanted to look at people around him and say, don't you guys get it? Don't you understand? I think he had to show incredible self-control around people. Because you know what it's like to be around people. And he wasn't oblivious to that, but now he's fighting against his fleshly nature as he's around people. Because he had that too. And he had to show self-control. So we have a choice. And our choice affects others. It affects us. Um, the choice is simple yet very difficult. Uh, it requires effort, but it also requires surrender to what the Spirit wants to do in, a, in us. And this is it, verses 24 through 26. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let's, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. We have to kill what wants to destroy us. Paul says it there. Those things have to be crucified. Crosses were used to kill things. We have to kill the flesh. It's going to destroy us. And Satan uses our fleshly human nature to separate us from God. We have life in the Spirit. That's what God is offering to us. But we have to work hard to stay connected with and in step with what the Spirit wants to do in us and through us. And we can't be proud that we know God and think, well, I know God and I'm okay and sorry about them. We can't treat others badly uh, for any time thinking, well, oh, God, I shouldn't have done this. Can you forgive me? And then a week later, do the same thing and go, well, God will forgive me again. We can't do that. Our choice must be to let the Spirit shape us to be like Jesus. Jesus was and is all the fruit of the Spirit. He was love, patience, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. He was all of it. And he wants us to be like him, that we might bear fruit, that people see these things in us and be drawn to him through us, through the Spirit working in us, so that they see what God can do in their lives because he's done it in our lives. We must choose that. Too many people choose the flesh. It's going to destroy them. They need to see that we faithfully choose to live in the Spirit and we choose to have life in Him. And perhaps by our faithfulness, some will be saved. The best thing about this is that when we think that we can't be what we see in verses 22 and 23, when we think, man, that's a tough list. I don't think I can ever be that. Maybe on your own you can't. But the Spirit's there. He's walking with us. He's helping us. He comes to live in us. He can help us be these things. He can help us be 
like Christ. We just need to surrender to him and let him go to work in us. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this text and for letting us um, just spend some time with it today. Lord, shape us to be like you. Help us to become uh, more like you in everything that we do. Lord, there's so many things that this, the flesh tries to do in us just to derail us and destroy us. God, we ask you for help, for protection, and for us to stay faithful to what you call us to do so that others may see that we are not perfect. Well, you've still got a lot of work to do in all of us. You've got work to do in me. God, help others to just see in me that you are working and that you're shaping me to be more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Today, as we come to our time of invitation, I don't know if you know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Um, we're going to sing a song, but let me encourage you. Remember that anyone whose name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life could be saved. They're going to be there in heaven. All of us have a past. God can forgive our past. He can change us. He can wash away our sins. And he can help us through life as the Spirit walks with us. We just have to surrender to him. So if you have a public decision you'd like to make today, please come forward as we stand and sing.
So I'm going to have Gary stand up. I'm going to have you come over here, Gary. Ellen can come too. So Gary was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, what, about three or four weeks ago? So he had a test this week and a scan, and uh, the cancer's in his liver too. And so um, that's not good news, but we also know um, that God is with him. Gary's been following God faithfully uh, for a long time now, uh, maybe all his life, and uh, he knows what prayer can do and the power of prayer. And so he just wanted to come up and let you guys know that. And I said, well, uh, Gary, what we're going to do, I'm just going to ask the elders, and we're going to come up, and we're going to lay hands on you, and we're going to pray for you. So if you guys would come on up here, um, we're going to gather around him, and uh, we'll just pass the microphone, and we'll just uh, pray for them, uh, for Ellen as well, as she supports Gary, and uh, just for strength for them. And, uh, and so I ask you to just kind of join in with us as we pray for him. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for loving us. You proved your love for us by enduring one of the most horrific things that we can even, can even imagine. Um, far brutal than probably even we appreciate. And you did it all because you love us. Well, if you're willing to do that for us, then you're willing to stand with us and be there for us in whatever our needs are. God, we know that you are all-knowing. You know what each and every need that Gary has is. We know that you love us and you love him tremendously beyond anything that he can imagine. And God, we know that you're all-powerful. God, I just lift Gary and Ellen up to you, Lord, and just pray that you provide for them everything they need as they endure with whatever is laid out in front of them. Your son's name we pray. God, I know that you're a God of great power and uh, that you can do anything. Lord, I know that Gary has great faith in you. And so, Lord, I just pray that um, you would just heal his body. Lord, make it something that's unexplainable, where only the glory and praise can go to you. Um, we know that you also work through doctors. You'll do things as he's getting ready to start chemo. Uh, you'll work through those things as well. But, Lord, I, I pray most of all that whatever happens, uh, whatever place God takes Gary, that his faith will shine through, that people will be changed by it, uh, that they will see your love and your faithfulness, and that you will give Gary and Ellen all the strength that they need. In Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for this opportunity that we have to, to come to you with our, with our needs and our pain and our, uh, our wants and our praises. And, and we just lift up Gary and Ellen to you and we just thank you for their, um, their faith. Thank you for the fruit that they display in their, in their lives. Uh, thank you for their friendship. And uh, we just lift them up and pray for strength and encouragement. Uh, we pray for Gary as he, as he struggles with this. And, and we pray for your, your healing, your peace. Uh, we pray for uh, relief from the pain that he is enduring. And um, we just pray that you would be somehow um, glorified through this even this. We just ask this in Jesus' name. Dear Lord, thank you for Gary and Ellen and their leadership here in the church and the example that they set for all of us. Lord, we thank you for your strength and your courage, and we pray that, pray that you bless them with that strength and courage as they deal with the obstacles that will be before them. I know, Lord, you have the strength to knock down obstacles, and I know you have the the ability to use difficult things and bad things for good purpose and we pray that through everything that uh, we have to deal with that you provide the path and and clear the way and uh, use things for your purpose I pray in Jesus name father we thank you so much for for being an all-powerful God we thank you for being all-knowing and and all present. Uh, we thank you for 
your healing power that you demonstrated so much, uh, not only while you were on this earth, but in the centuries and uh, years since then. We come before you now in a request to uh, heal a fellow brother that uh, is going through physical pain and ailments. And we, we know that uh, as we trust this to you and, and request this from you, that you will heal him. Um, we, we pray that you will uh, use this experience to be a witness to those uh, in all of our lives that they might see and understand how you work and and understand that you are an all-powerful God as well. Uh, we pray these things, Lord, in your name. Amen. Thanks for praying with us, everyone. Um, go and be blessed. Have a good day. So.